All right, so welcome here. This is not going to last long. I, actually, I'm trying to cut this very short in order to have some time to, for a conversation. So please get focused. I'm going to go fast, 15 strong minutes. Um, just let me know up front how many have uh, already heard my talk on Tuesday. Please raise your hands if you were on the talk on Tuesday. OK, so it's a like minority. Just to know not to repeat things too much. All right, so uh, here's the thing. There's something weird coming up to our way of working in the next years. Something that's probably a little frightening. Frightening, and, and let's, let's try to understand what is it and how to be prepared for that, okay? So first of all, I need to, to do a little outing act. I'm uh, an intruder in the Agile community. I'm not strictly part of it. Yeah, actually, I am part of it, but I am equally part of other communities, like organization design community, lean startup community, service design community, serious gaming community, and other things that are working on the same topics. All these communities are asking themselves, how is our future going to be? So I can propose you a different perspective, which is not focused on software. So this is outing. If you don't like this kind of things, now you know it. So just quick, because we've heard very interesting thing in a previous keynote, what happened? Just a little context. We have built organizations for 150 years to be durable, stable, and predictable, right? And we did it so well that now we're striving to change them, and they don't, because they're stable. So hierarchy was born for that. Taylor divided people thinking from people executing, and we're organizing, we've been organizing our structures in that way, hierarchical, very solid. Now one thing happened in the meanwhile, and this is a diagram from my friend Nils Flagging. He's published a nice book on this. So I'm, aware, I'm here if you want to ask more. So this is what happened. We've been coming from an age in which complexity was really high due to human interaction. It was the market of, you know, lo the, the system of local markets, high customization, craftsmanship. This was normal, it was really high complexity. Then, through technology, industrial age, we went into an era in which complexity fell down. Few players controlling markets, and so rules pretty stable, and you were able to foresee your future, the future for your company or for your work for the next maybe 20 years in the 60s, okay? So this is now unthinkable. Today markets are back to this level of complexity thanks to the technology we have developed there. Actually, if you imagine the whole mankind history, this thing, which is called the Taylor bathtub, completely disappears. This is a singularity. It's something that it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a inverse hype. Normal, the normal situation of mankind has always be, been high complex. And today, markets look like this, okay? This is a good representation of any wide human system today. Any dot is a player, and these are the connections between players. This is roughly the definition of complexity. Number of player, number of interactions, emergent dynamics, unforeseeable, right? So this is having consequences due to the fact we still have old structures to manage into this situation. These consequences are social, as you might have seen, because this applies to our governments and wider societies, not just companies. So people have been complaining about 100% controlling 99% in different scopes, not just in organizations. I will cut this short. You know about Arab Spring, you know about Occupy movements. But also, good things are happening thanks to this new situation. People can get together without central, centralized control and planning and create value in ways that have never happened before. Okay, so the, the, the result, as we have heard, is the world is getting smaller and smaller, but things are getting faster and faster. So it leaves us with the question, what the heck is going to be tomorrow to work in this kind of world? Now, some of us turn to these kind of things. Uh, who knows what this diagram is? Please raise your hands. 
No, what well, it's one. This is the hype cycle. This is published every year by Gardner. It says where technologies and new things are in their maturity slope. So normally there is a first part where ex expectation rise. This is the hype. This is where things go mainstream and where you read about them on the newspapers and everybody is talking about them. Then there is a, a disillusionment. You stop, the, the high expectation don't meet reality normally. This is true also for human relationships. So this is where things start to get real. And here then you have the slope of enlightenment and where things get mature and really produce value. So something is good if it arrives here and produces way, value broadly, gets mature, all right? Probably agile is somewhere over here now, I would suggest. Anyway, if you look at this, on the top, you see things that we hear about. Autonomous vehicles, um, wearables, cryptocurrencies. I guess we all hear about this. But if you look at what is coming, you see weird things. You see neuro business, biochips, affective computer, smart robots, human augmentation. What the heck? So what is coming is a completely different world. Who's going to take care of my children? A computer, a robot, myself becoming half a computer, half a robot. These scenarios are upcoming in the next few tens of years, not in the next century. So this is a little frightening, isn't it? So we are devising tools that are completely changing our society and questioning our own identity. And this is new, right? Wrong. We've done this all the way around for our history. It's normal for us today to fly over oceans. This is not a normal human thing. We have devised printing press that changed the world. We have devised something you may have heard of, which is called internet that changed the world. This is not new at all. But this shows a very important relationship between us and the tools we devise. This relationship was studied by Marshall McLuhan. I know that no, almost nobody knows about him here, so this is very agile, focused community. Please read about him. He talks about media. Media, in his speech, in his terms, are not television and newspaper are anything that extend human capabilities. And he says that we shape these tools, these medias, and then our tools shape us, shape our society, shape our way of thinking and of living. So in this relationship is both our fear and the solution for our future of work. And when I look at this, I use this diagram, when I use, when I look with when I work with change in human system, I use this diagram. And I see, at the very least, four layers. You can imagine this as, a, this as a river flowing, which is the life of the human system. At the bottom, close to the bottom of the river, things are a little slower. And the surface, they, get, they go faster. Okay? This is fluid dynamics. I'm, I love fluid dynamics. I'm sorry. I'm, I study aerospace engineer because of fluid dynamics. So when you look at change, you have to look at the four of them. Of course, you can change, you have to change tools and processes, but also competencies, culture, and people. Hmm? So how does that work? People with our you know, relationships, consciousness, emotions, and everything that is in the person generate culture when we get together. And we get together all the time, from a family to an organization. We generate a culture in what we do together. This culture generates some competencies, which might be looking after children, might be programming software, okay? Something we are able to do. And for that, we devise tools and processes. And this is how we do it. Now, all the way back, tools and processes generate the need for new competencies which in turn evolve culture and which in turn help people to evolve. This is the relationship. But if you are questioning yourself about the future of work and you still keep work just watching tools and processes, you will not get what is coming. 
Because tools and processes that are coming, the ones we were looking on the hype cycle, have been generated by the needs of people tens of years ago and now are reaching the surface and we see what is coming, but this is coming from what we were as humanity 30 or 40 years ago. If you want to know what we are going to generate in the next future, you need to look at the bottom of this diagram. You need to look at people. You need to look at what probably we are, we are saying that we need for our future. Because with that, we'll generate new competences and then eventually new tools that now we don't even imagine. Okay? So the thing I want to tell you, and this is the key of my talk here, is that it is all about people. So stop worrying too much about with which methodology, which technique, which tool to use, and start looking into your people, including yourself and your family, if you want to understand where to go. Now, this is exactly why we work in collaboration. In this way, we strive to evolve the techniques of collaboration, respecting individuality, having the right pace, using the right tools as well, in co-creation like this, and doing these kind of things all around the world in different communities, we've gathered a few insights on what seems like uh, the desire in people for the next future world. So what is likely um, producing the next situation and next tools. Um, there is an article I published on the Huffington Post. You have seven of these things. I will just tell you three here to give you uh, last, like a highlight. You look for my Twitter, you can find the article and you have the other four. So the first one, complexity is reality. People in the world know that. They don't want an expert to go there and tell them how to manage complexity. How many here have children? All right, is, is reality complex? It is, okay? So we don't need a coach an agile coach, an organizational coach to tell us that complexity is reality. We want organizations that embrace this and don't try to tell us that we can plan and control our reality. This is what we want. And we want tools that help us to deal with what is simply life, normal life, complexity. Second insight, work is not a place. Okay, I'm going to work is not a uh, a movement is an intention of what I want to do. Working is creating value, not going to a specific place. So thanks to technologies, this is changing really fast, of course, posing new challenges. But again, if you want to know how it is going to be, if you don't want to know what tools will be needed to do that correctly, to do that properly, people is, are telling this. Okay, I've been working from here, I've been working from everywhere actually, and most of you are. There are works that need more time in present with some specific people, but still you can move with them around the world. This is new, the world is smaller, you can do that. Third and last thing, tools are means, not goals. Okay, we've been crafting tools like agile techniques, like money itself, like organizations, because we wanted to achieve something as means. Those are not our goals. So people are telling us, let's put that back in the right place. Let's put us and our goals in the center and then the means that are better for that. Not the other way around, including money. There is a lot going on with the relationship between mankind and money as well. Now, what we need are new organizations that allow these things to happen and then allow the new tools to be chosen. Remembering also that organizations are tools themselves. So what we've been working on is a new generation of adaptive and anti-fragile organizations. So meaning that if you imagine an org chart, a rigid structure as a picture, we don't need a picture on the wall anymore, formal system static, we need a formal system. That's important for coordination. But if it's static, in the meanwhile, things will go on in another way. So we need a movie. We need an animation. We need something that can change over time, that has structure, but is an, a dynamic structure, is adaptive. Moreover, we need it to be anti-fragile, meaning that the more stressors, the more change, 
the better it gets, okay? So all over the world, including ourselves, we've been working on this. We think that values and principles can be put in the place of roles and titles in such organization in these new ways of work. When I say organization, you can imagine a team or you can imagine government or a company or anything in between, huh? human systems. We believe that engagement can replace the old attitude to command. And we believe that empowerment, which means giving resources, information, um, decisional power in the position where it's needed, can replace control. Okay? These things are now appearing as muda, as waste in the lean terms. So this can enable people to get together in, in, in what biological systems do. We're not fish. It's much more difficult for us. We have culture. We have egos. But we can do that. We're doing that. A lot of people do, are working to allow this. New tools that allow this in the respect of individuality and in the leveraging of the human dimension, we can do this. We can act as a dynamic body made of people. This is what we are hardwired for in our DNA. This is how we've changed the world. And now we need to do this more effectively. Now, we've devised a system. I don't want to speak about it. If you're interested, liquidorganization.info. It's a, an agile governance framework, let's say, platform. It's not prescriptive. It's descriptive. It is devised in order to bring this neuroplasticity into our organizations, OK? But anyway, you want to implement these kind of things in your team or in your organization, you need to implement these four routines, these four sets of processes. So you need to strategize, sorry, it's a little wider, which simply means putting things in perspective, sharing the view, understanding this view, okay? You need routines to perceive. In complexity, you need to perceive. You need to, it's like going with a sailboat. You need to know what is happening around you. You see clouds on one side, you see cliffs on the other. You need to perceive what is going on. You need to let information flow through your organization and within your organization. You need to test. You need to run experiments. This is for sure because you don't have anything granted in complexity. And you need a system to implement what works and make it the new now standard to change it tomorrow, okay? This, in a word, implements something that we have seen in the previous video, which is what we, in our adaptive organization design, we call the ambidextrous organization. It means we need organization that with one end execute their current business model. They execute what works, and they execute it better and better more efficiently with more delighted customers. But with the other hand, are testing what they are going to be tomorrow. In the other hand, they have an adaptive structure, an agile, strongly agile structure that is keeping that beginner mindset every day. And what works goes to design the other hand. So this is a continuous organizational improvement framework. This is the basis of it. All the rest are tools. Then each of us will test and try the tools that we prefer. We believe, and here I close, that all this can just happen if we understand we need to evolve in three directions as human systems. We need more consciousness of operational agility, of leanness. We need to understand what is value and how to take the waste out of that. And I don't really care that much if that is agile, lean startup, um, old manufacturing lean. We need to define what is value, streamline that, and understand what in that moment is just obstacling the, the creation of that value. Okay? In the other direction, so this is about collaboration. In the other direction, we need to open up to meaningful conversation. We, we need to understand we are part of an ecosystem inside and outside, and we need to let those knowledge flows come through us. This is about conversations. We need to help establish and connect meaningful conversation, which is not protecting our intellectual property, our uh, classified information. In some cases, that's a good thing, but today, 
I would say 1% one, 1 of the cases. And usually for the sake of the customer, not for our peers. So this is about conversation and the only, the last one is about inclusiveness, it's about co-creation. We have the technology now to put everything that people think and feel into crafting a new direction, into strategizing, into sensing, perceiving. We need to learn these things. I've heard a lot of confusion in these days. Okay? If you are part of an organization, a team, you, you simply cannot not collaborate because an organization is done for collaboration. It's like breathing. And that doesn't mean you have to be in a meeting all the time. That's completely wrong. It's bad collaboration. And the solution for bad so collaboration is not throwing the water with the baby because the baby here is the future of humanity. It's learning how to do that properly. When you breathe and you have to breathe, you have to inhale and exhale. So people need to be alone to be enabled to feel and think and then be able to bring that back to the group and work together. And there are a lot of techniques for that. We are working all over the world. Please visit events that are not just agile. Go around, open up this community to meaningful conversation. Co-create with other people, try that. It will change everything, I swear, I promise. So please just make it happen, that's all for me. Thank you. Timing, I don't know if we have time for questions, do we? Yes, we do. Eight minutes, so if there are questions of any kind, yes, please. Is there a microphone? Thanks for a very nice talk, Stelio. Uh, the, the diagram that you showed about uh, the fluid dynamics, the earlier uh, one, about the laminar flow wherein the uh, flow is moving very slowly at the base, that is brilliant. That's, that's uh, we, we are trying to understand a very, very complicated system. So we uh, take a very, we take it to the laboratory, we take it, we uh, create a controlled environment, we study it. And now we want to go back in reality and try to understand how a river flows maybe. And there are so many more complexities involved. What I'm trying to come at is uh, within a river itself, there are some molecules of water which would be moving very, very fast compared to other molecules, even though they are at the same uh, altitude. Yes. Perhaps because they are flowing over a different strata, different rocks, different soils or yes. whatever. Similar complexities do exist with people. And uh, has there been any effort to study the types of people, the pace at which different people move? Uh, and of course, the pace at which they move in horizontal direction is one thing. The pace at which they affect the vertical direction about cultures, tools, that's also another thing. Yes. So there are so many more complexities involved. Absolutely. Have there been any ways, any methods, anything, any research done on this? OK, thank you for the question. I think we need another hour here. I didn't want to enter into the technicalities of this diagram, but just to give you some hints that I'm available, I, I don't know if there are other questions. If there aren't, I take all the time for this one. So the thing is, of course, this is a very simplified model, but there are a few interesting things. So first thing is about laminar flow and turbulence in fluids and in human situations. You have laminar situation in which people are aligned, and then you have turbulent ones. Nature, interestingly enough, deals with turbulence in iterations, in oscilla os oscillations, how do you say? Okay, they oscillate, they... Okay? So, an underdamped system maybe? Sorry? An underdamped system, there is a response to stimulus, it goes beyond the uh, optimal diverge. level and it can go it can and, and then stabilizes. So, here the skills are those of implementing an iterative system to keep things aligned. Turbulence is a good thing. It transfers energy from one scale to the other. Same goes in human systems, but you don't want that to diverge. So you want to keep that going when it's going and then bring it back to, to laminarity. So this is one thing, how, it's very long, okay? But it's, it's an agile thing, it's about iterative stuff. Second thing, you see here there is an action. When we try to change a human system, we drop a stone into that, we drop a new pro pro project management tool, a new, technology or something and say, okay, now work with that, everything will change. Doesn't, you just 
it just creates uh, diversity perturbation in that moment and then it fades. What you need are new habits and the habits which sometimes are brought in by tools. You, bring, you can bring in, for example, a Kanban tool and you don't just bring a tool. You bring the need for new competencies, for new culture, and eventually people start to change with the small habits. So what is the smallest thing that you can do to, that's, that's a complexity concept. The smallest thing you can do that will give the biggest impact in the future, the divergent impact. And that are habits. So again, this is about how you interact with such a complex system. Third thing, you know about Shu Hari, and this is common in the agile community, right? There are three stages. So you practice the role, the, the, the rules, the, the tool as they are, as your somebody tells you, look, this is the way, do it. Then you start changing that. And through changing that, you test its elasticity. And through testing the elasticity, you start making the principles behind the rules your own. And doing that, sometimes you make it worse, sometimes you make it better, that's okay. Sometimes you fall when you're learning to go on a bicycle. And this is something where we coach should be very good at, leaving that fall. Because otherwise they get sti stuck in the half level. But then they go to the re-level. The re-level where they just don't remember the rules. They don't need the rules. They can make the rules as they go because they have absorbed the principles. Now this is very nice and it works. But this works at different velocities for different people. And this is something that in collaboration we should tell the team, just telling it, make people aware that maybe in our team, I am in the re phase and another person is still in the shoe phase, still needs to go with the rule for another while. So this is about a big shift in culture and this is why I say that collaboration, co-creation, conversation are so important. It's a shift from ego systems to ecosystem. It's a shift from in perspective from, oh, I don't want to still doing that ritual, that's silly, okay, but have you listened to the rest of the team? Maybe you are the only one that is ready for going to another structure. Maybe they need to be there for another three months. Can you allow that? That will help you as well. So it's a matter of culture as well. Hope I answered, it's complex. Yes, uh, that was very nice. There's one very small note I would like to make. Uh, you talked about uh, a group of individuals acting like one system. Yeah. I think ants are a much better example. We can think of ant colony as a single organism rather than an organization of individuals. Well, yeah, but you can think of humanity in the same way. We pass information through DNA. This whole thing about our individuality is as much important as understanding that mankind is an organism and that as Taleb says in anti-fragile, anti-fragility of the wider organisms comes at the cost of fragility of the individuals. That's nature. So that happens a lot as well. And when we do these parallels, it's also common in agile, both swarming, bees, ants. Remember, we're humans. We have higher level of complexity due, due to our culture and social relationships and due to the ego. An ant doesn't have an ego as far as we know. We do, so we have to take that in account and we can work with that and make that work better for the person and for the group. The thing is that our collaboration techniques are really immature, yet. We have to learn. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think we have over. Thanks.